Good evening and welcome to our Tech Fest Digital Festival 2021 this year. Um, we are again hosting our festival online because of the ongoing current events, but um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be back to some sort of normality soon. Um, after the feedback we received from last year's Digital Festival, which was so positive, um, we felt we could um, go online again this year. Um, the, with so many new audiences from not just across the local area and across Scotland, but across um, the world as well, which was which was just blew our minds slightly that our our we we charity based in Aberdeen could go far and wide. But it was um yeah it was very exciting. So um we just thought we'd go out for it again. So as ever, our thanks go to our joint principal sponsors BP and Shell, and also to Equinor who are kindly sponsoring our digital public program this year. Um, we are in a webinar function and we are recording um, this presentation, so it will be available on YouTube um, in the next couple of days probably, but it does mean that your cameras and microphones are muted and turned off. So if you do want to ask any questions, please put them in the chat box at the bottom or the question box at the bottom and we'll get around to them at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to announce um, that our presenter for this evening, Bryn Coulthard from NCR, um, is doing, I'm sure it'll be a really interesting talk. We've just been chatting before we got started and some of the stuff I'm like, how does that work then? And how does this happen? And what's going to be next? So I think it's going to be really interesting. So um, I'll hand over to you, Bryn, and we'll just get cracking. Thanks, Jenny, and, and hi, everyone. So Jenny, just a quick one. You were still got, it's quite, a, quite an intimate group. Let's go with that. So if there's any questions that come through during the the conversation that you think are best in the moment rather than at the end then feel free to, to yeah, interrupt sure. me and ask them because you know I think we've got a size of group where we can handle that but um, if not if you want to keep them to the end that's fine with me. Okay um, cool. Cool but good evening everybody and um, thank you for for your time joining me tonight. Um, so I'm Bryn Coulthard, I'm an executive director at NCR responsible for our digital banking business across the international markets. Um, Thanks for taking time out with me today. And I really wanted to take some time to share my thoughts on, on how technology is redefining banking and the impact and the opportunities that, that can have on the skills and the career opportunities moving forward. And um, banking for me has always been a leading industry in the development and implementation of technology. And that goes all the way back to, you know, the original um, ATMs and way back even before that, you know, original banking machines um, through to more modern inventions, interbank, payments um, and then debit cards, high volume payment networks and, and, and more. Um, but what I think we'll touch on today is really the advances in technology over the last decade or so have significantly changed how banking works and, and, and particularly how we will bank in the future and, and that is going to continue to, to evolve the skills required and, and equally the career opportunities that are available within banking. Um, so, so what I'd like to do first is give you a little bit of background about NCR and who we are. So as Jenny mentioned, I, I, I work for NCR. Um, NCR operates in around about 130 countries worldwide today, and our focus is around helping banks, restaurants and retailers run their business, and particularly focused on enabling how they serve their customers. Um, and, and you know that goes from small cafes to large restaurant chains, very small credit unions to some of the world's biggest banks. NCR powers that customer experience. Um, and I'm not going to go through all this slide for you. I'm sure you can all read it, but I'd just like to kind of identify a couple of key points here. So we are a leading provider across banking, retail, and restaurant segments. So we're the number one worldwide provider in ATM software. Uh, we're the number one worldwide provider of self-checkout and point-of-sale software for both retail and restaurants. And you can see some of the numbers there. You know, we process 180 million financial transactions a day. We are, we are very involved in the banking, retail and restaurant um, industries and helping make sure they run efficiently and effectively every day. What you can see on this page here, and I've, I've tried to kind of pull this out to, to show specific UK brands, but kind of gives you a feel of some of the companies that we work for, whether you're trying to order a Whopper or a Big Mac meal or scanning your shopping at Sainsbury's or Tesco's or trying to take money out the ATM at, at Santander, Barclays or Nationwide. And um, literally, if you've done any of those things that I've just talked about, then you've interacted with NCR, NCR's technology and NCR's hardware. Um, so as I say, you know, anything from 
the, the till systems and the big self-service checkouts in, in Sainsbury's or Tesco are, are all NCR machines. Um, a lot of the, the order kiosks at McDonald's and Burger King and Dunkin' Donuts and similar are provided by us. Um, and so while you might not see us, you've certainly kind of interacted with our, our solutions. So I'm going to take a little bit of time now and just talk a little bit about how banking's evolved. And then I'll start to talk about you know, where I see the challenges and the opportunities in the future of banking. But you know, banking has been around for centuries. Um, and NCR have very much been part of that kind of banking and retail kind of sales journey for over 130 years. And, and we've been part of leading many of the major technology driven changes in that time. You, know, you go back to 1879, and this is one of the very first cash registers that NCR sold. Um, and, and, and also, you know, we're one of the co companies that really pushed the introduction of the till receipt and had a big marketing campaign around till receipts. Now, what you might find interesting is both cash registers and till receipts were invented to stop staff stealing from shop owners. Because if you think about it, it before the, the invention of the till and the receipt, if, if somebody in the shop sold something without doing a full stock take every day, the owner would never know what had been sold. We then kind of fast forward through into the 1970s and NCR were very instrumental in the rollout of ATMs into the UK and ultimately the worldwide markets. And that's something that we've become um, renowned for over the last kind of 50 years or so. You can see how an ATM has changed from 1970 through to the kind of um, the last few years. And, and, and NCR have been at the forefront of that evolution of ATM and self-service banking over the last 20 years. But it's fair to say that times have changed and, and banking certainly changed. And, for those of us you know, in, in the industry, what we've seen is more than a third of the UK branches have closed since 2015, you know, between 2015 and 2019. I was talking to Virgin Money today and they were telling me that they've shut something like 100 of 240 branches in the last two years. So that, that, that continues to change and, and ultimately banking is, is not really a branch experience or a branch story anymore. Um, banking is now about digital. Um, and NCR continue to lead and, and be at the forefront of that market about digital banking. And we currently have over 26 million people who use our digital banking uh, online or mobile solutions to, to do their kind of daily banking. So with digital banking now being the new norm for banking, and, and that's you know that's very much the case in the UK, but it's equally so worldwide. And you know, I, I, I work across the globe and, and every country is facing the same scenario where you know, between digital banking, the rise of online shopping and introduction of mobile payments has really redefined to people bank and shop. And a journey that, that's really only going to continue to involve. And you can see some of the stats on the slide here. So three quarter of us are using internet banking UK wide. And that, I suspect that includes all of us, but equally includes our grannies and our grandpas and everybody else who's had to embrace it over the last 18 months as we fought our way through the pandemic. And the reality is that, that, that that's not going to change. I mean, majority of people who start using online banking tend to get quite comfortable with it and tend to stick with it. The, the other thing that really jumped out for me here is, is the kind of penultimate stat around digital wallets. And you see 45% of Generation Z customers made a digital or mobile wallet payment last year. And, you know, I think... The, the rise of digital wallets, the Apple Pays, the Google Pays or similar is really changing how people shop both in person and online. And that, that these, these two trends about the adoption of internet banking and the adoption of, of things like mobile wallets and cashless payments are, are definitely here to stay with us and definitely changing how banking happens. And, and you can have a look at this slide here so that there's kind of two lines in here. The gray line is your non-cash transactions and in the bottom blue line is your, your cash transactions. And what you can see is that rapid growth, so that's 2014 through 2024, that rapid growth over that 10 year period of the use of kind of mobile and card payments and how much more common that is today. And ultimately cash numbers haven't moved particularly, but they're becoming such a small percentage of, 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 of the payments. And it's now kind of less than 10% of payments are, 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 are made in cash. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know about yourselves, but I certainly very rarely use cash these days. Everything tends to be done with card or, or mobile wallet or similar. And 
and that's clearly a habits that are, are forming for a lot of us and trends that are, that are playing out worldwide as well. So, so that kind of giving you a bit of context about where banking's come from, and you can see from that kind of initial cash register back 130 something years ago, through to you know your your Apple Pay and your Google Pay and, and all the things that we're doing this year, um, banking has changed quite massively, and how people shop and pay for goods has changed quite massively. Um, but let me talk now about kind of what's happening now and how. How things are changing now, and, and, and things how things continue to change, and there there continue to be a number of forces that are impacting banking. Um, the first one I would talk about is really changing consumer habits, and I think we and you know, all of us are consumers. We're really expecting more from our banks, and um, I think as we we spend our life, you know, interacting more online in that kind of. We all live in this always connected world. I mean, I can guarantee you that most of us, if not all of us, could put our hand on our smartphones right now. They're never really too far from our person, whether it's six in the morning or 10 at night or anywhere in between. Um, and that's kind of how we live our lives today. And, and that's really changing the expectations that consumers have on their banks and what they want from their banks. Equally, technology is having a massive impact on banking, and it always has done, as I've shown you through some of those earlier slides. Um, but what you're seeing now is that kind of emergence of, of the big tech firms that we talk about, so the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, um, but equally, you know, Microsoft, uh, you know, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, the work they're doing in cloud and, and, and data is, is massively changing things. And then, you know, the Internet of Things you know, we've now talked about people having fridges and everything kind of connected to the internet, how that's going to continue to change. Maybe not so much banking, but certainly shopping and people talk about, you know, your fridge being able to order milk for you and stuff like that. That That's not pie in the sky stuff. That stuff is here and will, will be with us very soon. Um, but that's, you know, there's real disruption coming and real opportunities coming from the changes in technology. <clears throat> and then it wouldn't be banking if I didn't talk about the relentless pressures and, and a big one of those is is the regulators you know there's competitive pressure i'll talk about in a minute in a bit more detail but there's always things changing in your environment whether it's the, the state of the economy interest rates brexit something obviously quite close to home for all of us and will make quite a big difference but regulators equally are, are constantly looking and they've, their job is to look at these technology disruptions these consumer behaviors and make sure that they can control and manage the market in line with that and try and avoid any kind of major trip ups. And for those of us that were involved in banking back in 2008, um, you know, we, we certainly don't want to go through any of that again. But all of these forces are making you know, a real kind of imperative to, for banks to invest, invest in technology, invest in that digital transformation if they want to remain relevant and, and they want to survive. So let me go now and, and talk about a couple of the big changes in the, in the last 10 years. Um, the, the first one that I, I would want to kind of take a little bit of time to talk about is the arrival of fintechs. Now, fintech is a, is a word that I use every day in, in work, if not 100 times a day. It's very much just part of what we do now. You know, NCR as a company work with loads of fintechs. All of the banks that I work with work with fintechs. It's just part of the world now. Um, 10 years ago, that was not a phrase that you heard. It certainly wasn't a phrase that you heard often. We used to hear about tech firms that wanted to be suppliers to banks. So everybody worked with IBM and everybody worked with Microsoft and all these big tech companies. But what you've got now is a set of technology firms who are really looking to change banking, to challenge that status quo and compete with these established banks. And I'm sure you'll recognize some, if not all, of the, the kind of logos on the screen. Oh, sorry, logos on the screen here. Um, but WISE, as they're now known, or transfer wise, as they set up originally, they have massively changed how, how people move money internationally. International money transfers used to be a very um, kind of closed school, uh, almost an old boys network of I'll send the money from this bank to that bank, and then that bank will send it to the bank around the corner, and then they'll pass the money to the person you want to send it to, and everybody will take a little bit of a cut along the way. And WISE have totally turned that in its head and said, you know, we can send you money anywhere in the world for, for a few pounds. Um, and, and 
you know, a, a really interesting disruptor there. And then you get into the likes of Monzo, and, and I'm sure, you know, Monzo, Revolut, Starling Bank, uh, I suspect some, if not all of you, are, are, have chosen to bank with them. Um, but they've really changed banking, particularly in the UK, and said, you know, banking doesn't have to be hard and frustrating and everything else. They've really tried to make it as simple to engage with them, um, as simple to use. And, and they've, you know, they've really... They've changed the reputation of banks. These guys are not seen as boring banks. These guys are seen as cool startups. Um, and, and they are doing things a whole lot differently from the traditional banks. And then PayPal, I'm sure we've all used in some shape or form, but you know that very quickly changed how people pay for things online and, and particularly pay for things online internationally and, and, and you know really kind of massive change there. And then um, the one that's really coming through more recently is, is the likes of Klarna and others. So um, buy now, pay later is, is absolutely the kind of hot area of banking right now. And they're going to have a, they are already having a real impact on how banks and particularly credit card companies do their business and how that operates. But, you know, all of these kind of come under that fintech banner. And, and ultimately, this is something that's recently emerged and something that we never, ever talked about in the past it, it was always you know banks were trying to work out how to compete with banks now there's a whole list of kind of new competitors out there and these guys are equally happy working with banks as well so starling bank while we're trying to compete with you on the high street are also selling you banking software to make you more efficient in the background um, but you know these guys are really changing banking Equally, I think, you know, as much as the fintechs is, you know, the, a number of companies are, are really kind of new tech-centered companies that are ultimately operating outside of financial services are creating some real disruption in the banking sector as much as they do in their own markets. So I'm sure most of us have now used, you know, Amazon or Netflix or Spotify or Uber or similar. And, you know, I've certainly used two or three of these on a daily basis. Um, but what these guys are doing is they're not trying to, compete with banks or be banks, but they're really changing how we expect as customers to interact with other companies. So all of these companies have invested significantly in technology and looking at technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning. And what they're doing is they're using them to, to present us with products or programs or songs that are aligned to our needs and tastes. I mean, I'll be honest, sometimes it feels that Amazon know more about what I want to buy than I do. And that's absolutely what they're trying to aim for. They're trying to give you that kind of highly curated experience targeted at your individual needs based on any previous interactions you've had with them. And to a certain extent, a whole chunk of tracking analytics from our internet activity. So you go looking for a bike on the internet and next thing Amazon's trying to sell you bikes. That doesn't happen by accident. That's major technology investment that they've made. Equally, every flat time I fly out to our head office in Atlanta in the US to go to HQ, Uber knows when I switch on Uber app at, at Atlanta airport, it knows I want to go to the Marriott Hotel because that's where I always end up staying. And again, that's Uber learning from, from what I do, knowing that when I'm in this place, I want to go to that place. And, and again, these are significant investments that have been made by these companies to do that. And together, they're, they're all really focused on taking that friction out of the experience making our interaction with them as enjoyable as possible. And this is ultimately the challenge that we as customers or consumers are now pushing back in our banks and, and ultimately saying to them, if a tech company, many of which don't even make any money yet, can do it, why can't you as a bank with decades of data and, and some of the deepest pockets around not manage to provide that same level of experience? And really what these companies are doing is trying to deliver that high value contextual what we talk about hyper personalized experiences. They're not just trying to sell another product to another someone. They're very much tailoring their, tailoring their interaction with you to you as an individual person. And, and that is massively shaping you know, our expectations on everything that we do. So you get such a good experience from a number of these companies that you expect that experience to play out everywhere. And that's um, equally so and equally relevant within our banking interactions. So, building on some of my comments from the previous slide around things like personalization, this for me is one of the biggest challenges for, for banking 
as customers move away from that branch driven experience to a very digital only engagement model. And, and the, the challenge is how do banks leverage the data and the technologies available to provide that personalized approach? And, and, and as I said earlier, your customers are very much becoming used to that in their day to day. That, that is the default. That's what we expect to happen. And anything short of that ultimately plays through as a disappointment. If you think about the type of information that banks hold about you, they know, they know what your income is, they probably know what your personal situation is, whether you're married, whether you've got children. They've got insight into all our financial transactions. They know how much money we've got left at the end of each month. They know how much money we spend in the supermarket. I mean, the list goes on. If you think about the, the level of data and the level of insight that a bank has on you. And, and how do they use that data for the good of us as customers is the big challenge that they're trying to solve. And looking at how do they tailor insights and recommendations to, to, to us as individuals, recognizing our unique circumstances, rather than kind of delivering some generic marketing or recommendations engine that wants to offer you a credit card because it saw your balance that blew a certain level or similar. I mean, ultimately the challenge is how do banks make deliver that personal experience and provide tailored insight to you as a customer. And, and if digital is going to be the only channel we're talking to a bank on, they've got to work out how to do that through digital channels. They can't rely on that previous kind of human interaction. I, I, this, this is one of my favorite areas and, and one that I think is, is a really interesting example. So it's a great example where tech firms are showing the banks what, what can be done around personalized. And, and what I'm talking about here is personalized pricing. So for those of you that have used Uber or similar, you'll be fairly familiar with the concept of surge pricing. And it's really quite simple. Uber basically dynamically price for every ride that is booked and they price it based on the current situation. So when it's busy, the price is higher. When it's quieter, the price decreases. And that's really, you know, if you think about it, classic supply and demand management, but it's one that banks haven't really addressed. Um, I mean, sure, the banks can create interest rates based on risk profiles. So somebody who owns their own house and has a steady job might get a better interest rate than, than a kind of gig economy worker. But again, those profiles are fairly generic and, and based on industry-wide models, rather than really recognizing my or your unique set of circumstances. And the pricing of products is not so much based on the current cost of services, but more on a kind of model view of what it might cost them to lend money over the, the term of a, a product. And if you think about a term as maybe three years or five years, that, that's quite a long time. There's no real shared risk and reward around the rise or fall of costs. And, and I think this is an area where, you know, particularly as we move into the world, we talk about microfinance, um, which, which you know, everything from your fridge ordering a pint of milk for you, but probably more focused on, on the buy now, pay later um, surge from people like Klarna then banks are going to need to get very much more personalized and much more dynamic in their pricing if they want to compete with people like Klarna. And then, you know, financial wellness, another area. So, you know, no matter how independent we think we are, we all need financial advice and support at some stage of our lives, whether that's opening our first savings account, dealing with student loans, looking for our first mortgage or planning for retirement. Throughout our life, it's important that we understand our finances and banks have a real opportunity, and some might say a real obligation, to help us in that journey. Um, and, 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 you know, adapting the kind of emerging technologies, and they've got a real opportunity to deliver both timely and personalised insight based on their understanding of our individual financial position. Um, helping customers track their finances, set their financial goals, achieve their financial goals, ultimately helps banks build engagement and build trust with their customers. And that's that's what develops customer loyalty for them. But you know, all of these things are really require a kind of strong adaption, not sure I like that word much, of, of the kind of technologies available to them to help them drive that out. And it, it's really all powered by kind of data analytics. So so just jumping back and talking a little bit about NCR for a minute. <clears throat> As I mentioned to you earlier, NCR operate across a number of the market sectors, be it financial, retail, hospitality. We also do some work in kind of travel. But that puts NCR in a really unique position to help all of these organizations better understand their customers' behavior, not just within the financial organization or the retail organization, 
but also those customers' wider interactions. And we really look at this, and you know, we're, we're reaching over a billion end customers, which is just a, a kind of massive number to try and get your head around. But you know, all of the interactions that these customers have, we have visibility of what's going on there. We can see that data. And we're really building around that customer need and using the data from those interactions um, to, to help drive more personalized experiences. And our, and our vision, one of our visions as a company is really to power the convergence of financial and retail experiences, trying to turn those everyday transactions into meaningful relationships. And if you think about, you know, I've talked about the kind of insight you can drive from, from understanding the kind of financial data. If you were to then overlay that with your retail data, so yes, I spent £100 at Tesco's, that's what the bank sees today, but Tesco can tell you what you spent that £100 on because they've got the breakdown of, of, of the, 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 the kind of guess the shopping trip or the transaction. If you start putting those two things together, you can build a really rich pattern of, of a customer, a really rich profile, and then start to give them some real advice and insight. And, and you know, we've done some work with some retailers and some banks um, where you, know, you, you start looking at when you're given financial, you know, if you want to call it insight, it's maybe not financial insight, but if somebody's trying to save for a holiday, if they were to switch from premium coffee to, to own brand coffee, how much more quickly would that help them reach their thousand pound target to save for that, that holiday? And again, you know, even the retail and hospitality, all of these things come together and you can build a really rich set of um, insight and advice and, and, and recommendations based off the data that comes together there. But basically, if, you know, everything I've talked about so far, whether it's the Uber experience, the Netflix, the Netflix recommendations, the personal touch from your bank, or creating those meaningful relationships between banks and retailers and their customers, it all comes down to one key commodity, and that is data. The solid data is at the heart of all of these experiences. And, and the challenge that many organizations are facing, and particularly banking, is organizing and understanding their data. The advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and many more areas of technology is all down to understanding the data. And this demand to really get the best out of your data and understand the data has seen real significant changes in the focus and the opportunities. Um, and you see skills now such as data science. Now, when I was at university, which was a few years ago, uh, data science was not a skill that existed. We did computer science or maths or similar but data science is, is, is a kind of massive high demand skill now because organizations really want to understand the data they've got get it organized and drive the value from that data so really you know as it kind of head to the final few slides what does all this mean to you and your future opportunities in, in, in terms of uh, career paths and career options and um, what I would say is that the future for banking technology and opportunities in Scotland has never looked better. I mean, it is, it is a great place to be right now. So Scotland is a major banking hub. So we've got significant presence from, from Virgin Money, from RBS NatWest, from TSB, and many more of those who are, who are all investing significantly in technology skills. TSB recently opened a new technology centre in, in Edinburgh. RBS have got a mass, massive presence still in Edinburgh. Virgin continue to invest in the Glasgow network. Um, and Barclays is another one who've just opened, a, I think, a 3,000 person campus in Glasgow. So you can see that, you know, there's real investment from the banks there. And a lot of the roles that they're filling are technology roles. But equally, um, FinTech Scotland, who are the organisation that can oversee and, um, and can help steer the FinTech industry in Scotland, are, are currently reporting over 175 FinTechs who are active in Scotland. Now, that's a massive number just in its own right, but you know, there's some major success stories in there. Companies like Modular, who are really changing the payments landscape. And you know, Modular actually power a lot of the payments capabilities for big brands like Revolut. And Direct ID, another company I know pretty well from Edinburgh, who are really kind of maximizing the value of open banking data. And then you get into the kind of larger, more established tech firms. So companies like Avalok, who provide a lot of investment banking platforms across Europe. And then, of course, most importantly, NCR. Um, and, and we've got, you know, 
something like 450 people based out of our campus in Dundee and continuing to invest heavily in it. So as I say, you know, NCR, we're, we're investing very heavily in our technology and, and that's supported by significant recruitment across the globe, including in particular our, our Scottish base in Dundee. So um, you can see on this the slide here, um, through 2021, we've so far, this is just for Europe and Middle East, recruited 184 graduates, 54 interns, of which 60 of them in, are in Dundee. And I think there's about another 100 um, experienced uh, software and design guys who have joined um, the team in Dundee as well. And, and we're taking people from all sorts of backgrounds, be that computer science, ethical hacking, mechanical and electrical engineering, and also deploying them into a number of various business functions across software, software engineering, professional services, who are the guys that go out onto, onto client sites and, and help deliver, um, you know, take that product and make it work for that particular bank or restaurant or similar. And then product management. So product management is part of the group that I sit within. So our job is to understand the market, where the market's going and, and look at and what, what do we need to offer in terms of products? How do we support our customers, be they banks or restaurants or similar, in terms of how they can help best serve their, serve their customers? Um, but you know, while I've talked here about the various degrees and stuff, for NCR, our focus is as much around soft skills as it is you know, on, on the degree. We, we want to we, we recruit the individuals. We want to understand you know, what are their soft skills? What, how can they demonstrate an interest in the industry and understanding of their chosen career path? And, and what I would say is, you know, we, as you can see there, we, we hire from all different degree backgrounds, but it's very much about finding the right people and, and people who will fit within our organisation. Um, but, you know, what I would say, you know, NCR is a company with, with great opportunities. Um, you know, there's opportunities to work in different industry sectors, opportunities to work in different locations so I've now been with NCR I think five years last month and I've worked you know I've worked with teams and customers across the globe so you know I, I, I was saying to, to Jenny from the TechFest team earlier I go to America probably every couple of months in normal circumstances spent a lot of time in Cyprus and Serbia and Switzerland I even had the opportunity to go down to Brazil for a few days to, to present at a conference down there and um, and, and every day within NCR, I, I talk to people around the world. So today has been a fairly common day. It started with calls with customers in Turkey, then spent a bit of time with people in the UK, and then as the afternoon progresses, you switch over to the US teams. And, and you know, there's really massive opportunities in, in a company like NCR. And, and you know, we, we can, you know, there's great, um, I say, opportunities to develop your career there. So I'm going to close on this slide. Um, really, you know, if you want to know more about particularly what NCR do, there's a couple of links or QR codes um, here for you. You know, we, we're always looking for interns. We're always looking for graduates. Um, but you know, I was going to close at that today. Uh, thank you all for, for your time. For those of you that joined, um, I hope this was interesting for you, and I'm certainly happy to take any questions from here. Yep, we have questions. That's good. Um, so, Sarah would like to know if you think digital technology, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll start again. Do you think with digital technology, you will continue to travel the same way you do today? Um, you know, there's a little bit that says, well, so you mean me as a person flying around the world with NCR? Or I think just in general. I, I think, I think, yes. Um, I, I mean, I think commuting to an office is definitely changed in the last two years. Uh, I'm not sure everybody's bought into that journey yet, but you know, you hear a lot of chat about the great resignation, as the Americans are phrasing it. Um, I think people are starting to vote with their feet. What I would say is, I don't go to the office very often, but I very much enjoy going to the office. Um, and I, what, what I would say is it's different for different people at different stages of their career. I spent a lot of time on the phone to, you know, young software developers and stuff in London at the start of lockdown who were literally moving from one side of their bed set to the other side of their bed set. And I wouldn't want to do that day in, day out. Um, but equally, you know, is there still the need to, to move to London? Is there still the need to travel into a city centre every day? 
I think it's definitely changing. And every company that I talk to, be it banks or technology firms, they've all changed their attitude mm -hmm. over the yeah. last uh, year and a half or so. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, yeah, if you've got a house and you can move from the kitchen to the living room to your office, then that works. But I think I'll, I know personally, it's a social interaction with, you know, like say chatting over the coffee machine or, or you know, just saying, well, what did you watch that program on telly last night? Yeah. Or that kind yeah. of like just chit chat that, you know, that's what you miss rather than, and if MD's stuck in a one bedroom flat or like you say, a bed sitting in city centre with nobody around them, that must be really, really tough going. Yeah. But then, yeah, then equally, you know, my experience of, you know, development teams and similar in the offices is they generally sit with headphones all day talking to each mm. other on Slack. And it certainly doesn't merit paying expensive train tickets to go into an office to do that because that is just the same from your house. But I think it, you know it's important that we've got offices. It's important that people get that interaction, mm -hmm. the ability to whiteboard things, to problem solve is very valuable. And I think that the social interaction shouldn't be uh, underappreciated. No, I don't think so. Especially if you know you're on your own anyway and you haven't got immediate family around about you not so much maybe now that we're coming out of lockdown and all the rest of it but certainly when it was on lockdown it was um a bit isolating to say the least yeah absolutely um okay so a couple more questions what course would you recommend at uni if you wanted to join ncr um i think any of the ones that i touched on back here oh, i think i just hit i blink excuse me do you do that i think any you know Computer science, it, it, again, it, I, I think the important thing is to do something that interests you. The, you know, would I say it's a career goal to go work at NCR for MD? Probably not. The career goal is to find a company that offers a good role in an area that you're interested in. Um, NCR can give you a great opportunity, give you lots of great opportunities. But if you have a passion for computer programming, then that's a great thing. If you're more interested in electrical engineering, then you know these two degrees could open up different kind of career opportunities. Um, but you know, we, you know, as I say, data is data is the big thing right now. I mean, everybody's looking mm -hmm. for data people. If you understand how to do data science well, um, you know that's that's a very positive thing. I know even a couple of friends of mine at, at my old age are away doing data science MSCs and stuff because. It's absolutely where where it's at now. It's all the algorithms, isn't it? Yeah, and you know it, it, it it's kind of massive. But I think it's you find the degree or the career path that that interests you, and you know it will help influence the type of companies you go to. But you know, much as I am a, a big supporter of NCR, I wouldn't say it's a career aspiration to join NCR. Um, but you know, if if, it, if they do roles that you're interested in, then it's a great place to work. It's like any other job, really, isn't it? It's just finding where you want to be at, with the right company, whether it, you know, and the niche you want to be in yeah. as much as anything and being able to move from there. Um, okay, Steve, going back to one of your earlier slides and asks, do you think cash will eventually disappear altogether? Hey, don't quote me on this because I work for NCR and we sell cash machines. Yes, I do. Um, I guess the last couple I of years has exacerbated yeah, I, that I, I a bit think, quicker, hasn't it? Well, I mean, countries like Sweden and Norway are massively further ahead than us. So they're way down the path. There's banks in Sweden that don't accept cash. So you cannot really? go into a bank in Sweden with cash. How does that work? <laughs> because they, they, they just don't. I mean, it's just they don't handle cash. Cash is a hard thing to control in large volumes. You need big safes. You need two sets of staff to deal with everything. They just don't do it anymore. I think, you know, it's... It's harder now to live without cash than it is to live with only cash. You know, um, so much of, our, of what we do, we get paid in electronically, even if you're getting benefits from the government, it's all electronic now. Um, you know, the, the, the places where only cash is accepted is getting a lot smaller. And I think, you know, the more non-cash transactions increase, the cheaper it will be to the point that for, for shops and stuff, it's as easy to have card. Um, so. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. And, you know, we, we still haven't got rid of checks. We tried to get rid of checks and everybody kind of, well, not everybody, the three people that use them kind of pushed back. Um, but I think, you know, over time, checks are definitely disappearing. Um, and I think cash is, is, is losing its importance. But, you know, there's a lot of surveys on the go. You see a lot of feedback and I don't want to diminish any of that. Cash is very important to a lot of people still. 
Um, and until there's an alternative or until those people are comfortable dealing without cash, then it will stay around. And, you know, disappear, and we're talking in about 50 years probably. Yeah, um, I guess I better go and take my piggy bank down the bank and get it counted out then. <laughs> That's going to be the case. <laughs> I still like cash. I think it will be there long enough. Yeah, well, I know, but you think about things in the back of the sofa and stuff, you think, well, what do I do with that? And if cash disappears, how am I going to get that cash back? Well, yeah, and the challenge is with inflation, that cash is just losing value. Mm. So, I mean, let's face it, I mean, even, you know, if I do use cash, it's always notes I use, it's very rarely coins. Yeah. I mean, I'll take coins back as change, but it just goes into the piggy bank and then I cash it all in later even, kind of thing. Even my eight-year-old daughter doesn't take cash anymore. If she gets given cash for her birthday, she gives it to me and says, can you put that on the bank card for me, please? So <laughs> that's scary. That kind of says it all, really. Yeah, no, uh, well, but then right enough, because, I mean, th your daughter's generation will be growing up with mobile phones and things that they won't know any different. I mean, I remember the day you used to go out in the morning, you know, if you're lucky, you had a phone box and 2p in your pocket to phone home if you needed to. So, yeah. um, okay, have we got any more questions? I, I've got one, just as a matter of interest. Are the fintech companies you mentioned earlier, are they mostly based in the central belt or are there more up um, this neck of the wood? I mean, apart from I, yourself and Dundee, obviously. Yeah, so there's, I don't have the, the split. There are quite a few. So Dundee's quite a kind of, mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the right word I'm looking for here is, kind of grouping of, of fintech. It's like a hub, so, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so Waracle, who I know pretty well, um, are one of the biggest mobile development companies in Britain now. Okay. Are, are based in Bash Street in Dundee. Um, so Chris Martin and the guys there do a great job. They work across banking, they work across healthcare. So they are they are flying just now, to be perfectly blunt. Um, there's there's a number of other um, good companies. DC Thompson in Dundee do a big mm -hmm. data centre. Is it Bright Solid or something, I think they're called? Oh, um, okay. So, so there's certainly, you know, I would say a lot of them are in the, the Edinburgh space is probably the strongest. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, as we talked about locations and stuff, you can get jobs anywhere. I know from having talked to the Direct ID CEO in the last few months, he's shut his offices down. Everybody's gone remote. They get a WeWork office or something if they need to get together. But he's hiring developers across the globe now because he just wants people on time zone. He doesn't really mind where they're sitting. So I, I would say, you know, um, there, there's no reason why living in Aberdeen or Dundee or anywhere should change your opportunities for some of these companies. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Um, and I, I think that they don't have quite a lot of the, vid I'm saying video games, but you know what I mean, like the, the computer games are based in Dundee as well, Dundee, aren't they? Dundee yeah, they've the got quite a lot of technical area. stuff down there. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Um, I don't know that we've got any more questions. I think we're out. That's, that's good. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you so much for, for doing that for us and uh, giving up your evening. That's okay. Um, I've got more work to do after this, don't worry. <laughs> no, never. That's the downside of working from home. You never get to switch off totally. Absolutely. It's always there. Um, but that was really interesting. So um, thanks to our audience for tuning in tonight. And I hope you all enjoyed it. If anybody thinks of any more questions they'd like to ask, then do email them in and we can pass them on. Um, somebody saying thank you very much. Love the talk tonight. So that, that's good. Um, thank you. Um, and yeah, please remember we are still running until the 1st of December, so there's lots more to be, be found in our programme if anybody wants to come. That's somebody else saying thank you. So good. Thank you. So thank you very much, Bryn. Um, that was really interesting. And uh, yeah, cool. Great. Cheers, everyone. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.